Sales conversations. Don't you just love them? What's that? You dread them. Your palms get all sweaty and you get shaky hands. Oh, you can't sleep before a sales call? You're not alone. For most people, even the idea of selling something makes them feel uncomfortable, let alone actually having a sales conversation. But if you are in business, selling is a crucial activity. Without it, you can't generate revenue and without any revenue, you don't have a business. So let's address the dreaded sales call and talk about how to approach a sales conversation. Hello and welcome to the Savvy Corner. Welcome back if you're not new, I'm so pleased to have you here. If this is your first time on the channel, my name is Alisa and I help people rewrite their financial stories. On YouTube, I talk about managing your money, your business and your mind around it. In today's video, we are going to talk about sales, specifically how to approach a sales conversation, what to do to prepare for it, how to structure it and what to do after. Selling happens across industries. So to give this a bit of context, I will mostly focus on sales conversations for coaches, consultants, content creators, and other similar service-based entrepreneurs. In this world, we call sales conversations discovery calls or introductory calls. So throughout the video, I will be using these terms interchangeably. That being said, let's jump straight in. First of all, what is the purpose of a discovery call? This is important. And you might say, well, the purpose of a sales conversation is to sell something, obviously. And you are right, but it's not just that. Selling is an exchange process. You receive some money in exchange for a service or a product you sell. The key here is to understand this. You might be selling a service, but that is not what the client is buying. They are buying a solution to a problem they have. This is, in fact, the exchange, a solution to a problem in exchange for money. When you look at it this way, the purpose of a sales call becomes clearer. You want to make sure there is a match between the problem the client has and the solution you are offering. I hear a lot of coaches say something like this, book a discovery call with me to see if we are a good fit for each other. Being a good fit for each other is necessary, but it's not enough. Yes, it's important for you and your clients to have similar personalities, to have a certain chemistry, to have a click to work well together. But if your services are not a good fit to their problem, being a good fit for each other becomes irrelevant. Just the other day, I had a conversation with someone who is lovely. I've known them a long time and we've always got along really well. They wanted help with consolidating their pension and doing a bit of financial planning, which is not what I do. So I referred them to a financial advisor instead because there was a mismatch between my services and their problem. So the purpose of a discovery call is to establish three things. Number one, can I help this person? Is there a match between the problem and the solution I offer via my services? Number two, do I want to help this person? Are we a good fit for each other? Do I like them? Do I think we will work well together? And number three, based on my answers to the first two questions, what do I need to do next? So before having a sales call, you need to have clarity on who is your ideal client and how is it that you can help them. If you haven't seen my video on how to find a niche for coaches, I strongly recommend that you watch it. I will link it for you on the screen and in the description box below. In addition to that, you want to know exactly what you are offering and for what price. I suggest not selling hours of coaching, but rather structured packages with clear benefits. Have a couple of options, but don't overwhelm your potential clients with too much choice. Keep it simple, both for you and for them. If you want your prospects to read something or watch a video before the call, make sure you send them that information in advance. Let's say in the confirmation email containing the date and time of your call and instructions on how to join. Ideally, you would automate this step and you can do this via your scheduling software, but it's okay to do it manually too if you don't have the infrastructure in place right now. Perhaps something obvious now, but I will mention it anyway. Make sure you have an appropriate place to conduct the sales conversation, a quiet place where you won't be interrupted. If you're doing the call online, check your internet connection is working. 
and test your camera and your microphone before the call. All right, now you know what the purpose of the call is and what to do before a sales conversation. Now let's talk about how to structure a discovery call. Before we do that though, if you're enjoying the video so far, please give it a big like and consider subscribing. It really helps to support the channel and I thank you in advance if you do. So how do you structure a discovery call? I use a five step process for my 30 minute intro calls, which starts with setting the scenes. It is good practice to have an agenda for the meeting and to let the other person know what you intend to cover during the call. Now is also a good time to ask them if there is anything they would like to add to the agenda and to make sure that you accommodate their request. This probably takes me about two to three minutes. The second step is to gather information. You need to know in great detail what their problem is so you can establish if you can help them or not. This step takes me about 15 to 20 minutes and during this time I listen intently, I build report and ask a lot of questions. The third step is coming to a conclusion regarding working with this person. I say it's the third step but it's likely to happen during the conversation. As you gather more information about the prospect and their problem, you will establish if you can help them and if you want to work with them. This is a silent step, so to speak, a conclusion you come to for yourself without necessarily verbalizing it to the other person. Step number four is to act accordingly based on your conclusion. Let's look at the different options here. If you decide you cannot help this person or you don't want to work with them, then you would simply say that your services are probably not the best for them at this point. If you want, offer to refer them to another professional, but the conversation would probably end here. If you decide that you can help them and would like to take them on as a client, then you can proceed to make them a sales offer. Give them information about your services and what it would mean to work together. I usually share a few examples of clients I worked with in the past who had similar problems and give them specific details about how I propose that we approach their particular situation. Based on that, I then recommend a coaching package and share details about it. Price, number of sessions, structure, what to expect, etc. And finally, step number five is what I like to call practicalities. The other person might decide that they would like to become a client and therefore the practicalities would be to discuss the contract, the payment terms, starting date, frequency of the sessions, etc. In a lot of cases though, people want to take some time to think about it before deciding to engage in paid work with you or not. In this case, the practicality would be to ask them how long they need to decide and to set up a meeting right then and there for a follow-up discussion for them to communicate their decision to you. And this is important. Instead of letting them come back to you via an email and having to chase them, you want to set up a short call instead and create some urgency around their response. In this follow-up meeting, you will either get a negative response, in which case you can find out more details, get some feedback, thank them and say your goodbyes, or you will get a positive response, in which case you need to discuss the contract, the payment terms and other practicalities I mentioned earlier. And that is how I structure my discovery calls. Agenda setting, information gathering, reaching a conclusion for myself, acting accordingly and practicalities at the end. We will talk about what not to do in a moment, but before we do that, what do you do after a sales call? You might have a follow-up call, which we already discussed earlier. If they decide to become a client, then you need to send them a contract with a deadline attached to signing it, send them a link to your calendar so they can book the first session, issue the first invoice, create a profile for them in your client management system if you use one, send them some resources or a survey they need to fill in and everything else that's relevant to your business processes and procedures. Now let's move on to what not to do. Don't treat the discovery call as a free coaching session. It's not, and if you do that, you risk coaching the heck out of this person and not allowing enough time to discuss your services and to actually make a sales offer. Don't let things slip out of your control. If the prospect wants to think about working with you, give them that time, but set another meeting to discuss their decision. Don't accept anyone and everyone as a client. 
Use the information you gather and your intuition to decide who to work with. Even if someone is willing to become a client and has their bank card ready, it doesn't mean you should take them on. If I decide that I don't want to work with someone, I don't even give them details about my services. It's a waste of my time and theirs, and I simply end the conversation. At the same time, if someone is interested in learning more, don't avoid conversations about price. When you do talk about price, don't proceed to over explain your prices or even worse, to jump to offering a discount immediately after you've stated your prices. Also, don't act as if by buying from you, the client is doing you a favor. Remember the exchange of value we discussed at the beginning of the video. And finally, don't make assumptions, especially assumptions about how much they can afford or are willing to pay. That is not for you to judge. Simply state your prices and keep quiet. Before we wrap this up, I also want to talk about mindset and what to think in relation to a discovery call. Here are a few things to keep in mind. You don't have to close every sales conversation you have. I was reading some statistics the other day and the average sales close rate across all industries is between two and 3%. Let that sink in for a moment. And fair enough, it is across all industries, but it's an average rate, which means the numbers in each industry must be pretty low. Not closing every sales call means that in some cases, there wasn't a match between someone's problem and the solution you offer. It is best for both parties to go their separate ways in this case. This is not about winning or losing. So if you get some rejections and you will, please don't take it personally. I have a separate video on how to deal with rejection as an entrepreneur, which I will link for you below. Also remember that the discovery call is a two way process. You are evaluating them and their problem just as much as they are evaluating you and your solution. You are partners in this conversation, two parties on equal footing. I hope you found my tips useful. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, you might also want to check out the two that are suggested on the screen right now. That's it from me for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.